Welcome into the Bassmaster Podcast. I'm your host, Ronnie Moore, and as always, my co-host, my main man, my guy, the digital content editor of Bassmaster.com, basically the do-it-all. Whoever gets it done, he's the one, he's the one who's going to get it done uh, when it comes to the web, and that is Kyle Jesse. Kyle, man, the season ended just a few weeks ago, but it has not let up. We've had Elite Series schedule announcements. We just announced the open schedule schedule for 2023. A little bit more details on the different format changes as well. It has been hot and heavy in the Bassmaster Studios and the headquarters with all these news releases and all of these events as we are winding down the open season for 2022 as well. Yeah, definitely a lot going on. And, and you kind of mentioned it there towards the tail end. Uh, you know, the, the open season for this year is still kind of hot and heavy. Still got three more events, starting with one, uh, you know, this week at the Red River. Still a lot of events to be had. And uh, like you said, a lot of announcements coming in at the same time. So it's definitely an exciting time. Well, today on our episode of the Inside Bassmaster Podcast, we have a special guest that we're going to tease a little bit. He was one of the three anglers to qualify from the Northern Opens division this past season. Just happened last week at the Chesapeake Bay, the final event of the Northern Opens, and Alex Weatherall won the points race, qualified for the Elite Series. He's got a cool path to the Elites from the Opens. He's a guy that I've met and covered on the water and events throughout the country. It seems like he fishes a lot of different divisions, even though he's from the Northeast. So we'll get to have him on the podcast in just a few minutes. But before we do that, Kyle, we did just drop a nugget this week, and that is the 2023 opens schedule announcement. I feel like it's like the, the two happiest days you have with a boat, the, the day you buy one and the day you sell it. It's the the same thing. The happiest you are is when the season ends and also when the schedule is announced and you can get thinking about the next year. And I know that we did that a few weeks ago with the Elite Series schedule. And we'll be able to talk to Alex about his thoughts on the Elite Schedule. But while we're here and we're kind of in an open themed podcast this week, let's talk about the 2023 Bassmaster Open Schedule, the St. Croix Bassmaster Opens. First off, the format changes. We talked about it with Hank Weldon and Chris Bowes. The moving and the changing of the tides going from a single division qualification system where you can fish three opens and qualify for the elite series. That is a thing of the past. You now have to fish all nine opens, all three divisions to be in the elite qualifier, the Bassmaster EQ race. And that is the points race. The elite qualifier race is the points race where we will decide the top nine in the points to go to the elite series. But Kyle, the cool thing about it is we've kind of created a second tournament trail within the same tournament, because if you fish all nine, your goal is the elite series. That's your, your focus is the elite series and you have nine shots at making the classic, but let's just say you're getting your toes, dipping your toes into the national scene. You're maybe getting to the higher level tournaments, testing your, your, you know, competitive desires and seeing where you stack up. And if you want to pursue this, maybe from the college series, maybe if you skip college, maybe if you're an adult, you finally got some weekend free time, you want to do some opens, you can still do a single division and you can still make the Bassmaster Classic. You can still win money and you can still kind of get that preparations if you want to jump in and do all nine. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, that's the best way to put it. And from my perspective, and I think a lot of people's perspective, the greatest thing is that it becomes its own secondary tour. Um, you know, I think that you can definitely look at it through that lens. Obviously, I think, you know, you're going to have basically – I'm guessing probably at least as many elite series anglers, um, you know, as many anglers fishing the entire EQ series that you would the elite series, maybe even more. Obviously, I think that's certainly a possibility, um, which is going to make it interesting. I mean, you're going to be able to follow those storylines all throughout the season. It's not going to be a matter of, you know, this this guy's doing really well. But then you go look at his angler page. And you're like, oh, he's just fishing the northerns. I mean, you're going to get to see these guys fish from the start of the season to the end of the season, just like the elites. And, you know, obviously looking at the schedule, it's very diverse, a lot of good lakes. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it a lot. I think that the first season is going to be really exciting. And I think that it's, it, it's like we talked about on the podcast with uh, Chris Bowes and Hank Weldon. Anytime things change, people are always instantly going to overreact. I mean, it's just human nature. We're going to overreact. Exactly. But I think by the end of next season, probably a few events into next season with the EQ format, we're going to look at this and be like, this is a massive upgrade. I mean, this is this is the way it needs to be. And that's just my personal opinion. I'm just speaking on the behalf of myself. Um, but no, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm anxious to get into some of these, these, uh, these tournament events as well, because definitely got some lakes that we haven't visited in a while. 
Well, and one thing that we'll say about the open schedule, we're about to tell you about that. I know we, we just started the podcast, but we wanted to kind of give perspective. If you're fishing all nine, normally when you fish three, you might have two in the spring and one in the fall or one in the spring, one in the summer, one in the fall. And you kind of have it, you know, time of year, you have three days to get it done for that time of year. Well, now, you know, it really resembles an elite series schedule. We have nine elite series events throughout the year and the classic, and they stretch from February to normally August. Well, that is February, March, April, May, June, July, August. That's nine events in seven months. Well, Kyle, we're doing the same thing for the opens because we're starting in March and we're ending in September, October range. So you're going to have about nine events in a seven to eight month stretch as well. So you're going to have to catch them in the pre-spawn, in the spawn, all the way to the fall, the summer transition, all of those different things, smallmouth, largemouth, spotted bass at times, you're going to see a lot of those different things come into play. You're not able to just fish your home lake, fish a lake that you've been to and fish a lake that you know a buddy that you can stay with, you know, and do that. One other thing that I will say that has changed uh, since we first announced the format change is there is a new off limits time period and it's going to resemble the elite series in a certain uh, aspect where 30 days before the event you cannot compete or you cannot fish on that body of water kind of has a 30 day off limits until the official practice time for that week of the event so when people say hey well if these people are going to travel on the elites or on the road for the opens to qualify for the elite series, they may fish weeks at a time at these bodies of water and have an advantage over these guys who maybe can't do that. That's not going to be the case. They have a month off limits until the official practice time. So it's going to really fine tune. Like we said, we're trying to cultivate the best possible anglers for the elite series from the opens. And when it comes to that, you got to also resemble the practice period. You have to resemble the strategy. You kind of have to resemble a lot of aspects to really duplicate and make good pros for the elite series. So that's one way we did that is you can't make a no info rule hardly, but you can make an off limits rule. No fishing 30 days before the event that whole month, but the week of the event, the official practice, you can then jump in and do it. Yeah. And if you're, you know, you, you mentioned this just then, but you know, if you're going to have an elite qualifier, you want it to be as similar to the elites as possible, at least the way I see it. Um, so I think that practice rule is going to be a, a good one to enforce this year. I think that'll definitely show, you know, once again, who can who can last on the elites whenever they get to that point, because it's it's going to be way more similar um, of a practice period to what the elite series, you know, season is. Uh, obviously, the guys fishing the elite series aren't going to have weeks at a time to go practice on a body of water the two weeks or however, how many, you know, how many ever weeks or days they're going to spend on that body of water. It's going to be a, a really good, um, you know, test for these guys. And, you know, I th think that it'll prepare them even more for when they make it to the elites. So the one thing that stays the same is we still have three divisions, even though we've kind of taken the divisions out, you have to fish all of them. You can still fish a division, like we mentioned, and they are no longer the centrals, northern, southerns. It is division one, division two, division three. It's just the way of classification on those. So let's go through the schedule real quick. I got it on my phone. We announced it yesterday as well, but... For division one, we're going to do this. I'm going to do division one, two, and three, and then we're going to do it based on calendar dates so that people know if you're fishing all of them, this is kind of this lake to that lake. So division one, Lake Eufaula in Eufaula, Alabama, March 2nd through the 4th. Then we have Wheeler Lake, Decatur, Alabama, May 18th through the 20th. Then in the fall, we'll have the Harris Chain of Lakes in Leesburg, Florida, October 12th through the 14th. That is for division one. Division two, Toledo Bend, Manny, Louisiana, April 13th through the 15th. Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma. Remember that. Now we have two Eufaulas on the schedule. Just don't show up to the wrong lake in the wrong month. You won't, there won't be a tournament going on. So Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma, June 15th through the 17th. September 21st through the 23rd is Lake of the Ozarks in Osage, Missouri. And then Division three, Bugs Island Reservoir in Clarksville, Virginia, May 3rd through the 5th. July 20th through the 22nd is the St. Lawrence River out of Waddington, New York. And then Watts Bar Reservoir, Kingston, Tennessee, September 13th through the 15th. So those are the three divisions. And Kyle will briefly go through the entire schedule uh, one by one, kind of get a thought about that, what you think um, when it comes to time of year, location in the country as well. But going on the calendar dates, let's go in order of the way that they're going to fish them step by step. The first one is March 2nd through the 4th, Lake Eufaula in Alabama. Last time we were there, we saw a June tournament for the Elite Series. That was 2020. 
You fall is a great place in Alabama, and it's one of those places you can start in the south, like for the maybe the beginning of the elite schedule or the beginning of the open schedule. You're far enough south, but it's not super south where it's Florida and they're already done spawning. It is one of those things where you're going to have a season. It could be pre-spawn. It could be spawn. You just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like from my perspective, since I moved to Alabama, I've only fished the lake a couple of times, but it's real hit or miss. I mean, it can be really, really good or really bad. I would say pre-spawn time of the year, March 2nd through the 4th. I think you're going to see some really big bags. Um, I mean, it's notorious for having some really big ones. I think guys will figure out how to catch them. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to the time of the year and then just another event on Ufall. Like you said, it's been uh, since, you know, the Elite Series season in 2020. And then I want to say we had a kayak and then a team tournament there last year. So uh, definitely excited for that one to, to kick off D1. Yeah, and for we're calling that, it D one too. Are, are you D one? Can we just we, what division? Yeah, you know, I would have been. Uh, I would have probably been a D three guy. You know, just my physical and my sports ability. I'm probably a D three guy, but no, yeah. So for D one, we're starting at Ufala, and I think that uh, you're going to see a lot of those red crank baits. You you know, we we've got the whole brush pile game there, but we often see that play sure. in the summer. We could see that maybe play, but it's going to be that chatter bait. It's going to be that moving bait deal. It'll be good to see that. Then they'll go uh, in April, Toledo Bend in Manny, Louisiana, mid-April. We're going to be into the spawn for sure in Louisiana. It probably is on the tail end of it, but we're going to start to see some of that. Hopefully that grass that has maybe started to come back in places, maybe it grew back strong. You, you know, you might still have some fish that are out in the abyss, forward-facing sonar fish, but otherwise it could be a just a great uh, spawn region. Maybe a little pre-spawn, maybe a little post-spawn, maybe a little spawn, just kind of all over the map right there mid-April, maybe some top water as well at Toledo. Yeah, it seems like, you know, really anywhere you go in the southeast, mid, you know, I guess that's just more south, anywhere in, in our general 500-mile radius of, of Alabama, if you want to say it that much, um, you know, fishing anywhere in April is usually going to be really good. Like you said, definitely going to be some spawning fish, I'd imagine, Um April, I mean, that's going to be a time of year where I feel like you, you know, you kind of mentioned it, you're going to be able to do just about anything you want. So I think those guys will smash them in April. Yeah, those cold nights will be ending. And so the, the fact of the matter is the last time we've had these events in January and February at Toledo Bend, you've had a lot of those fog days, a lot of those cold days. The, the cold evenings are going to be out of the equation. Then we'll go May 3rd through the 5th, Bugs Island in Clarksville, Virginia. I'm excited about that one because it's not far from where I grew up in North Carolina. Bugs Island is a place, if you look back at the old, when everyone called it the Bass Masters, when there was an S on the end, the 90s and early 2000s, Bugs Island or Kerr, Kerr Reservoir, that's a place right there on North Carolina, Virginia border. You're not going to see the biggest weights there, but you're going to see a lot of bush flipping. You're going to see some topwater stuff. You're going to see uh, the opportunity to fish on the bank or offshore in May, the first few days of May. I'm excited about that one because it's relatively unknown for most, if not all of the competitors in the field. Maybe a few fish some top 100s back in the day, you know, way back uh, when Bugs Island was featured in those. But Bugs Island's a unique place. It's definitely going to be a place that people are going to have to study up on because with that off limits period, they're going to have to get there and break it down quickly. Yeah. Unknown for a lot of the anglers and unknown for me as well. If it wasn't for you and, and our, some group of, chat. Uh, our, our group chat, <laughs> I wouldn't even hardly know that Bugs Island exists, but uh, no, I, I am looking forward to it. Obviously I've heard a lot of positive things. I've never seen the lake, never, you know, I don't know a whole lot about it, of course, but I do know that, uh, you know, it can be really good just based on talking to, like I said, you and a lot of, you know, your friends from that area. Um, so I'm definitely, when I saw that on the schedule and I kid you not, I want to say this real quick. I had not seen this schedule until the morning it came out, just like everybody else. I, I probably could have asked somebody. I should have texted it out. to you. I'm sorry. My bad. I should. I could have easily figured it out. It's not that I, I couldn't have looked at it probably weeks ago. I just haven't really had the time or desire. I kind of wanted just to be a little secret for me as well. And then also, I, Ronnie deals with this as well, but I didn't want to, when people ask me what the open schedule is, I wanted to look them dead in the eye and say, I have no idea. Because I literally had no idea. So anyways, we can move along. I just wanted to get that out there. I love it when people guess what the events are. I had guys say, there's a random tournament that's claiming a permit on a, on a boat, on a boat ramp, but it doesn't say what tournament it is. Is it an open? Can you tell me if it's an elite? Can you tell me if it's an open? I think y'all are just being, and I'm like, man, we got people pulling permits on lakes to see if we have a schedule going there. So very funny to see that. Uh, then we'll go May 18th. Through the 20th, Wheeler Lake in Alabama. We know Wheeler Lake on the Tennessee River. We've seen elite events there. 
It's not the biggest body of water for the Tennessee River, but in May, you could see people up the river, you know, the Elk River come into play. You could see up towards the Wilson Dam. You could see the, you know, all the way down towards the Pickwick Dam. The whole body of water, the flats, everything could be in play there in Wheeler. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one as well. I mean, that I think that I, I literally just got back like two days ago from the high school combine that was at Wheeler, and I have yet to fish it. But looking at all the vegetation as well, like shoreline vegetation, seems like, you know, as long as the 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 grass and, you know, bank vegetation was around, it seems like May would be a really good time to do that. Obviously, you know, in some places similar to, to Gunnersville, I think that uh, May, you know, at Wheeler would be, to me, it seems like would be as good as any um, outside of maybe, you know, the April time frame like we were talking about. But no, that'll be a good one for sure. What I do love is it's a Tennessee River body of water where it's not during ledge season, so we it's not going to sure. be predictable. You can see it one a couple different ways. Then we'll go to Lake Eufaula, like we mentioned, in Oklahoma, though. Such a big body of water. I drove over that place coming home from Luke Palmer's house one day on a shoot, and I was like, what lake is this? I passed like four bridges, and I'm still passing this lake. Eufaula is big. It's also dirty. It's one of those places where – in the summer, you think it might get tougher, but they keep that stained water. So it keeps some of those fish shallower than normal. They don't all just go offshore. You're going to be able to spread out probably, but there are going to be some hot spots that keep it a little bit more occupied. But you follow Oklahoma, glad to have an open there. A couple of these cities, Decatur, Clarksville, Virginia, Kingston, Tennessee, you follow Oklahoma. Some of these places getting it open for the first time is pretty cool to see. So you follow should be a good one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the St. Lawrence River, July 20th through the 22nd. That's the next one on the stop, and it's out of Waddington. So it's going to be a little bit different than we've seen lately with the lake. Uh, I'm not sure yet if Hank Weldon's going to make the lake off limits, and it's just going to be a river tournament. But in June, I mean, in July, it's the same week we were just there for the Elite Series. We're going to be there later for the Elites this next year and for the uh, Opens there. July is still seemingly spawn time, it seems, for smallmouth. So in the river – with just the river in play, maybe, you could see uh, some really good bags come out of there, especially up shallow, visibly seeing them. Yeah, uh, it's the St. Lawrence River. There's really not a whole lot I can add. I think they're going to smash yeah. them regardless what time they're going to be there. And like hey, that's said, perfect. There'll definitely, there'll definitely be some spawners, which will be cool. But, uh, but yeah, that'll, that'll be a good one. Then we're going to go to Watts Bar. We mentioned the Tennessee River. This is another body of water on the Tennessee River, September 13th through the 15th. Little tough time period. It's one of those time periods where it's that fall transition. It's still going to be blazing hot in Tennessee, but the fish are going to, the shad are going to start moving. I think we saw the college bracket there one time. A lot of grass comes up at Watts Bar, especially in the fall. It starts to top out. So we're going to see how Watts Bar fishes. It's a little smaller than some others, but people may make a long run up the river. There's a lot. I love Watts Bar when I went there for college series events, but it was in May and June. So we'll see how it goes there. Then we're going to go to Lake of the Ozarks in Osage, Missouri in September. You're an Ozarks guy. You're an Arkansas, Missouri angler. You know these places. September 21st through the 23rd, Ozarks. That should be fun because I can think of about three baits that I want to have on my front deck, and I don't want to open my boxes all turn. I'm going to have braid, and we're just going to run the banks. And that's, that's an awesome opportunity for these anglers. Yeah, absolutely. There'll be a lot of topwaters going on. <laughs> Definitely, uh, you know, a lot of that. Uh, you know, when you get to that far north, and I say far north, it's not like that's super north, but, you know, you'll start getting some colder nights by that time, and, and you know, it could be pretty good. I'm not saying that's a tournament where everybody's going to catch them, because it's a grind. That style of fishing is certainly a grind. You're going to have to earn it, but, uh, but no, by that time, it could start being really good. And also, I want to add that I just think Bassmaster hates the state of Arkansas, because Division <sighs> 2 is literally, <laughs> you're hugging the state of Arkansas, but we're not getting into it. Hey, I'm just I'm just complaining hey, a little bit. We on. <laughs> hey, Arkansas was so close to having an open this year. Maybe we'll have an open uh, next year. I heard that there was a couple lakes on the docket, so we'll, we'll see about that. Hank Weldon's going to work his butt off to keep some fresh variety. We will, and also I'll say Lake of the Ozarks. You have to either do it before March or after September because you do not want to have pleasure yeah. boater galore. Yeah. That is one of the craziest lakes in the country in the summer. So got to do it in the fall or got to do it early in the spring. We had a college event there yeah. one spring. It was really cold, really good fishing though. It was fun to see. Um, and so in the fall, a little bit tough, tough at times, but you're going to see some giants and you're going to see some awesome visuals. Then we're going to end the opens completely at the Harris Chain of Lakes, Leesburg, Florida in October. People are like, October, we always go to Florida early in the year. We went there in October for the college series and Kyle, you were there. What an incredible week of fishing for the college series. Their records fell and we know it's going to be good for the opens. Yeah, it was insane. Uh, you know, 
that tournament itself was was absolutely wild. Seeing Cole Sands, Connor Tomorrow catch them the way they did. Those weights 83 were eighty-three I mean, pounds. Historically, or yeah, I mean, historically big. I mean, literally as, as big as any three-day tournament in the history of bass. I want to say, um, but no, I think that going to Florida in this time of year, it's still good. Guys still caught them good, top to bottom, really. To be honest with you, but it was uh, that the high-end weights are really, really high. And you know, one thing I wanted to talk about when I first saw this, I, I was excited because. You know, we like you said, we only go to Florida, it seems like, or any, you know, national tournament, you know, series goes to Florida in January, February, like not even really into March. So I like the idea of going down there in October. And I think that these guys will definitely smash them. And I think May, June is also a possibility for Florida places. We also often sure. start there because um, we often start there because. Everywhere else is cold. Everywhere else is not accessible. And so the ability to uh, to, the ability to start a year in possible warm conditions is right there. Uh, Well, Kyle, that's our nine event schedule. We're going to go ahead and add in. We'll be able to talk about our schedule a little bit with Alex Weatherall, possibly. But I'm going to go ahead and add him in here. We're going to talk to the one of the most recent qualifiers for the Bassmaster Elite Series. Um, looking at that schedule, it's it's a very diverse schedule, though. I'll say you you can't just be a northern guy. You can't just be a southern guy uh, and get it done. Alex, can you hear us? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, could you, before we continue, could you turn your phone sideways? There we Boom. Perfect. Bro. He, he knows exactly what's going on probably interrupting him on his uh, lunch break but we know his world revolves around fishing now because we want to be one of the first people i called you that night wanted to be one of the first people to congratulate you on making the Bassmaster elite series man what an accomplishment three tournaments you got to fish a perfect six days basically and if you make a final day you have to do well as well so what a great three event stretch for you. And you got it done. You won the Northern opens points race and qualified for the 2023 Bassmaster Elite series. And now you can't relax because you got to be even more prepared to step up to the top level of, of your dream series now. So congratulations. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And uh, thank you for the phone call and thanking of me that day. I appreciate it. Well, man, it's, I've known you for a long time. Kyle is uh, a little bit younger than me. He jumped into Bassmaster a few years after me. Um, and but he's been around the opens the last few years as well and so to see you and I had to ask you how many years you'd fish the opens because I feel like when I was just a kid covering them you know just out of college I knew your name and you were you were active I always saw your name on Facebook as well Alex Bassmaster (laughs) Weatherall so I knew that he was all about the fishing game he was going to do it but you're from Connecticut so one thing that caught me off guard was I'd see you down in the Southern Opens. I'd see you fishing outside of your Northeast region, which a lot of the people in that region will stick to what they know best. But did you initially go to these different divisions to challenge yourself or to maybe escape the Connecticut winters and get down to Florida early in the year? Like, what was your whole mindset of jumping in different levels of the Opens, different uh, divisions to kind of, I guess, prepare yourself because this has been your goal the whole time to make the elites? Yeah, um, I mean, I'd love to say it was to get away from the two to three foot uh, of snow and, and come down south. I mean, I will say that was really nice. I mean, I, I would literally shovel out my boat, you know, and, and leave and come down to Florida. And, and while everybody was at home, it'd be, you know, 20 degrees at home and 70 in shorts and walking outside. So that was that was definitely nice. But I don't think that was quite why I did it. Um, I think for me, it was more so just more opportunities to qualify right um you know there was only the northern open that i was doing i couldn't i was in a in a kind of a interesting situation where uh i work at lunker city i basically uh in some aspects run uh the company i don't own it but um he allowed me the opportunity to go and and fish these opens i couldn't get the time off the fish all nine so i said well i can do more than three so why don't i at least go do six I'll get more experience down south or in Tennessee or in some of these, you know, mid areas. Um, And so I think, yeah, it was was more so like, A, to your point, let me go and try to get some experience on a lot of these bodies of water that, you know, fishing in the Northeast is totally different from the rest of the country. So I need to learn and, and grow in that area, but also give myself another opportunity to try to qualify. And Alex, one thing I wanted to talk about, you know, Ronnie obviously just brought it up there. You've been fishing the Open since 2016. Obviously, you're you're 29 now. Is that correct? 
Yep, correct. 29 now. So you've been fishing the opens for a few years. And, I, you know, one thing you see a lot of people do is, you know, jump into the opens, maybe struggle a little bit, and then just completely give up hope of, of even trying to fish the Elite Series. Talk a little bit about your, you know, your path to making the Elite Series and, and you know, your advice to these younger anglers that are, you know, jumping full, you know, full steam ahead into the opens, um, you know, and trying to manage expectations and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh man. I mean, I mean, to talk about it, there's uh there's a lot in terms of my story for these opens, because it wasn't even just the opens. It was also uh, the bass, you know, national championship and, and fishing the bass nation, which was pretty cool. Casey, uh, who just qualified for the classic at Oneida. Um, I'm good friends with him. I actually became friends with him in Louisiana at the national championship uh, where we had both qualified through the Eastern divisional in Connecticut. Um, it was actually at the national championship that I was in contention on the final day, ended up hitting something um, with my bow and took me out of commission. And uh, so that was where the first time I kind of experienced some real uh, character building, I would, I would call it. Um, and then from there, I've, I've had times in the opens where over the last six years, um, I've been close and I have had, you know, I think there was one year where I had a fourth and a sixth place and then I had 128th and there was times where I was in contention and then I blew an engine, you know, on one of the days and took me out of contention. And so, um, it has been, uh, you know, of course, in the beginning of this, I certainly wouldn't have wished that it would take me six years or, uh, so to get to this point, but I think it has definitely benefited me tremendously, um, both from a character standpoint and integrity standpoint, um, you know, just, uh, just even from a, from a faith standpoint, being able to serve God, not for what I could get out of him, but for who he was and to go through the situations and the things that I did. Um, and to come out of that saying, you know, what, like there, throughout these last couple of years, when I have fallen short, I've been able to say, you know what, like, got it. It's in your timing. It's in, you know, the way that you want it to happen. And if you want it to happen, and I kind of had to give that dream up to him. Um, but I also think from a physical and practical standpoint, uh, it has helped me tremendously to, to prepare me um, to Ronnie's standpoint on a lot of these different bodies of water, right? So Florida, Tennessee, Virginia, all these different places, I feel much more comfortable now. And I've learned how to, you know, practice differently, how to look at lakes differently, how to break them down. And, and so I think uh, to a lot of the anglers out there who are aspiring to get to the elite series, I think, um, you know, it's very true. You have to put your time in. And I think, uh, you know, one thing that my dad has said that has stood out to me is he said, would you rather have one year of success and, you know, and then end up not being able to handle that success and, you know, you make the elites for one year and then you're out kind of thing, or would you rather have sustained consistent success? And I think that is what I want. And I think that is the path that has kind of led me to this point and, and I'm thankful for it. Yeah, when you think about it, uh, I'm actually getting called by Hank Weldon right now because the schedule just got announced for the open. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I should even take this on the podcast live. But uh, when it comes to your journey, I've seen you get top tens in Florida, in Tennessee, in Virginia, and New York. Like you said, there have been some moments where you've gotten in the 70s and 80s, or there's four or five opens in a row where you maybe maybe you just don't have a good year at all in general. You know, you don't have a good division or you don't have a good season. For you, is there a kind of a, a persistent, like, I'm, I can't give up on this. The voices in my head say you're not good enough, but I can't give up on this. I'm only 25. I'm only 26. I'm only 29. I've got, I know this is still doable, even if, I, if, it, even if it takes me to my 30s to get this done. Yeah, there, there's definitely been, I, I feel like I'm uh, an extremely competitive person, an extremely persistent person. Uh, but with that being said, it, uh, there was definitely a few moments where I started to question if, you know, I should continue to do this or not, because I'm like, okay, it's been five, six years of doing this and I'm not qualifying, you know, am I cut out to do this or not? And, and I just had a, a few special people in my life encourage me and continue to lift me up and say, you know, yeah, you know, we really feel like you should do this. And, and, you know, that coupled with, when I look at it, I say, yeah, to your point, I've made top tens. I've, I've been leading, you know, days and in, in multiple tournaments before. So from that standpoint, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I'm good enough to be here. And yet I haven't been able to put the pieces together. So um, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, yeah, there was definitely 
uh, more than a few moments where I really questioned, you know, if I should continue doing this at, at multiple points during the last couple of years. Alex, one thing I found really interesting looking through your stats, you know, you typically associate northern guys with being really good at fishing northern lakes. And naturally, you know, if you, I mean, it's just the honest truth. A lot of times when guys qualify through the northerns, they struggle the most having to fish, you know, different bodies of water, water in the south they're not used to. A lot of your successful, like best finishes have been fishing southern largemouth fisheries. Like if you had to describe your fishing strength, your style, what you prefer to do, like, what would you say it is? Ooh, um, you know, it's funny you say that because I've like come to love Florida now and uh, I, I've come to love some of these southern places and, and how they set up. And, um, you know, it's funny because like the first time before I went down there, everyone was telling me, well, when you go to, well, we'll use Florida, for example, like when you go to Florida, you know, it, like a six inch difference in the, you know, the bottom depth is a huge deal. And I'm like, oh, how in the world am I looking at miles of shoreline and pads and i'm supposed to find six inch a, a deeper hole in here somewhere and, and it was extremely overwhelming but um you know now now i love it i love grass fishing um but at the same time i i've from up north here i love smallmouth fishing i love drop shot i love uh i, I it's kind of weird to say but I, I don't know if i have like one particular thing that i love or you know i do better than anything else i mean i think uh, a bladed jig is definitely a, has become a strength of mine which is played in Florida and played, you know, in places like uh, the James this year. But um, I don't know. I, I think uh, if, if anything, I feel very comfortable just adapting to whatever the situation calls for. And I think that's one of my strengths. Alex, walk me through your 2022 open season because your Northern opens was about as perfect as you can get. I think you had a fourth, a 10th and a 17th. So three finishes inside the top 17, and they're all different bodies of water. We mentioned it, the James in April, then we had Oneida, and then we had Chesapeake in the fall. Chesapeake was hard just to get a limit for people, hard to get a bite for some people. You had two really good events that you stacked. So you had a lead in points. You had the opportunity to just sneak in there if you did okay, but you went and did, you did well at the Chesapeake. Were there any kind of nerves after having such a good start to your season, but how do or die it was for the, for the final open of the year at the Chesapeake? Yeah, absolutely. So to start off with the Chesapeake, um, yeah, of course, right? So I've I've been here before. I've I've been close, and I'm like, okay, what's gonna happen this time that's gonna knock me out, you know? And and I had to stop thinking like that, and uh, I said, you know, again, if if it's God's timing, if it's His will, then you know, I just I surrender that, and uh, you know, I just need to do everything as if it's in my power and my strength, and you know, rely on Him because ultimately it comes up to that, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was putting in a lot of time, um, a lot of research, and I was really, I knew it would be a tough event. I think what ended up actually helping me in that particular event was that I spent so much time out on the flats uh, in that grass, and that's where everyone said it's going to be one in the flats. And so um, I had to just end up giving up on that. And so I ended up just saying, I need to go get a limit first, and then I'm going to go fish some of these areas where I think I can get a bigger bite. Um, and, you know, it really came down to just going and getting a limit, you know, and, and that's what was kind of surprising was how tough, you know, that place became, but I guess everywhere in September is tough. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the rest of the, the season, uh, the James, I think one of the biggest things I learned this year, and, and I've kind of learned up to this point is it's okay to have a bad day of practice. And so I don't look at that at the end of the day as like, oh man, I didn't catch any fish today. This is terrible. And, and you get down on yourself, but instead it's like, you know, you're eliminating water. And so after I think three days of practice down at the James of not catching hardly anything of size, uh, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to continue to eliminate this water, continue to look. And in the last uh, half a day of practice, um, I found that area where I ended up leading day one and, and really did most of my damage in that event. Um, and then Oneida, I have been to Oneida before, um, and I, I know what it takes to do well and make the top 10 because you can get sucked into catching numbers and you don't catch the size that you need to make the top 10 or to try to win. So thankfully for that event, I had a little bit of experience to finally fall back on. Um, and I just knew I had to go get those bigger bites and I was able to do that for, you know, two days. And I think I've a three-way tie for 10th place on day two and made the, the day three. So, um, and then day three, I just said, well, I, I can't go down at all. So let me just go to try find some big bag of, uh, you know, large mouth. And, and I didn't, but, uh, 
you know, it was a top 10 and like you said, a fourth. And so, yeah, I felt, I felt good, but certainly nervous um, based on my history of, you know, something happening to keep me out um, to finally, you know, reach that goal and qualify. So you mentioned something there that I wanted to key on. Sorry, Kyle. I just wanted to jump in and, and touch on this before we segue, but you mentioned you learned how to practice a little bit throughout the opens over the last six years. You learned how to figure out practice and you just said it's okay to not catch one or not have a good day of practice. What was your practice strategy? I mean, for the elite series, it's three days, you know, sometimes it's been two and a half, but three days of practice. Were you a guy that got to spend, you know, two weeks practicing before? Did you show up the Saturday, you know, the weekend before the tournament started or what was your situation? How many days did you normally give yourself and did you think about that, that if you did qualify, I'm going to have to change and go to three days of practice if you were doing something different? Yeah. Um, yeah. So typically for the opens, I practice from uh, the Friday before um, or the Saturday before up to the event. So five, sometimes six days, uh, especially if it's a place I've never been to before. The opens are kind of unique because there's 225 guys and then you have some of the pros that jump into it and then you have some of the locals so it's kind of unique in that sense because you're competing against some local knowledge, against some pros. Um, and so I felt like I needed that time, especially on a new body of water, to try to, to find, you know, some areas to do well in. But um, I think what I have learned the most about practice is, is so I'm, a, I'm someone that's okay with not catching any fish in practice or catching very few fish. To me, it's like I don't need that, uh, I don't need that mental reinforcement of, of catching them and, and being on them I just need the reinforcement of okay there's fish here I have a pattern I have something kind of figured out and and that's really what I think happened at the James was I found areas and then I expanded on those areas in the tournament right and I think uh, the downfall of some guys in the opens is that um, they want to find the exact spot before the tournament Whereas I think uh, what I'm learning from a lot of the pros and what I'm starting to do is that you want to find areas, right? So you have more to, to pull from throughout the tournament and because you've seen more, you've covered more water. And then in the tournament itself is when you actually, you know, dial in the exact spot, dial in the exact cast. And, you know, so from an efficiency standpoint, um, it's just, it's the best way to go about it in practice, in my opinion. Now, this is going to be more of a, just kind of a general question, but you know, obviously being from Connecticut, not necessarily the place that you consider like the bass fishing powerhouse, like you would say, like in Alabama, uh, Tennessee, um, Texas, some of these places. Um, you know, what was your inspiration to get into bass fishing to start with? Who were some of the people that helped you get into it? Just kind of give me a little bit of your early on story that made you fall in love with the sport of bass fishing to where you are today, because obviously you've reached the, the pinnacle of the sport. So just talk a little bit about your, you know, your journey from start to finish to get here. Yeah, sure. So um, we actually had a house on Lake Ontario uh, in Sandy Pond. Um, I had no idea how close I was to such an amazing fishery as a kid. Um, and then my dad's side, we had a house in Cape Cod. So I did a lot of saltwater fishing growing up there. Um, so I always knew as a kid, I wanted to, you know, do it professionally. And then, uh, you know, I'd say it was around 16 years old. And my dad was like, okay, you know, Alex, if you're going to do this, you really need to jump in and, you know, go compete or, you know, jump into some of these tournaments. So uh, my gym teacher was actually the president of, of a men's club. So through him, I ended up joining a men's club and fishing as a co-angler, learning how tournaments work. The next year, he helped me get into, uh, with actually Terry, the help of Terry Baxay, um, get into the Junior Bass Masters. And it was actually that first year that I won the state and then went to divisionals, which happened to be at home on Candlewood Lake won that by I think two ounces and then went to the world championship in Louisiana and, and I won that by two ounces. Um, so that's what kind of started it off. And, you know, and then uh, my, we're actually work now at Lunker city, a good friend, Chris Beeler actually used to work there and he actually got me my, my first sponsor with them. And so it's, uh, it's been a transition from that into the men's side, you know, or I would say the adult side um, on the Bass Nation. And so that's why I fished the divisional and qualified for one of the national championships. So um, and then it was around that point that, uh, you know, one of the guys that I, I really looked up to and mentored in Connecticut said, you know, you really need to jump into the next level. And so that's when I started doing the, uh, the Bassmaster Opens and, you know, I've kind of taken it from there. So, and, and I'll, I'll add one more thing. So I, I think, uh, 
you know, one of the big things that has stuck with me is that there's a, there's a lady, Sylvia Morris, who's the president of the, or, or was the president of the uh, Connecticut Bass Nation. Um, you know, and, and I remember it was at one of the casting competitions that we hold for kids at the, at the show. And I, I don't know how old I was, but I, you know, I went up to her and I'm like, listen, like, you know, cause I have so much passion and I'm, I know what I'm going to do and I'm going to do this for a living. And, and I'm like, you know, Sylvia, I'm, I'm going to be the next Brian Kirchel. And, you know, she's like, no, honey. She's like, no, no, no. Like you're going to be the next you. And, and I thought that was, you know, that really stuck with me a lot. And, you know, it's so true because each person has a different path to where they're going and what they're going to do. And so I think uh, I didn't realize it then, but you know, that was a really important piece of advice at the time. That's perfect. And Kyle, if you have to go, I know you're a busy man. You run everything on Bassmaster.com. So if you have to step away, please do. I'll continue this interview with Alex and get all the goods and we'll just talk junk about you if the rest of the podcast. But uh, Kyle, do you have anything else before you need to leave? I do not. That was really interesting. I, I love the points that he made there. And the, the last thing that you said, that's really cool. I think that that, that truly is the, uh, the truth. And, you know, hearing that side of your story is really cool. That's one thing, yeah, Alex, as we let Kyle go, I was going to ask you that. Being from Connecticut, you see Paul Mueller on the Bassmaster Elite Series. Uh, you see some of those guys who have made the classics. Brian Kershaw, did he ever play into your mind? Being 29, obviously the classic he won was right around the time that we were both born. I'm 29 as well. So he wasn't too, you know, I guess prominent in the bass fishing world before his accident happened. Is he just a living legend to everyone there? Is that growing up as a kid, is he just so spoken highly of just by the route he took and the pat and the way he carried himself? And then obviously to to accomplish his dream and so many others dreams that support him and make the classic. Is he someone that you looked up to or is it some of the newer age guys that have been on the elite series, you know, since its start? Yeah, I, I definitely think uh, he's spoken very highly of, you know, I, I know, uh, obviously, you know, like you said, you and I were born right around that time and so um what i did see was a lot of different people talk about him and uh you know people that actually knew him you know people that he was in the club with and so it was, it was just like especially growing up through the bass nation right because that's where he came through was, was the bass nation so you know that was like the person that i wanted to emulate because it was like okay if he could do it from connecticut you know and, and it was like this long shot you know dream at that point for me it was like okay so if he can do it then then I can so it was, it was that kind of thinking and mindset that I think uh you know for a lot of people in Connecticut because to your point like it's it's a small state right we're not uh some powerhouse you know bass fishing state and so there's not many people that make it from here so when someone does it it's kind of special yeah most of the time people from Connecticut would say their home lake is a lake in New York or Pennsylvania or somewhere else but I know there is a very good body of water in Connecticut I believe called Candlewood Lake and so there's you know some people will acknowledge that as their home body of water and so yeah it's not the most prominent place but man we've seen guys who are from there Kirchel won a classic uh, what's crazy is he made two classics he, he got dead last in a classic and then he won a classic and I think that is Absolutely incredible to do that back to back. We've seen Paul Mueller not only do well in the Bass Nation multiple years, but then make the Elite Series from the Bass Nation, win the championship. He's won two elites since then. He's really good at finesse fishing, smallmouth fishing, but yet he's won with spotted bass. And in Florida, with you, you've kind of taken that same approach and you fish down south in the opens and have had success. So, do you feel honestly when we're talking late September? about a month or so before, you know, registration begins for the elite series and confirming of the spots. Do you feel like you are completely prepared ability wise for the elite series? Or are you kind of going to take it as a, like you, like you do your practice, you find your strong suit, you find the area, the region, and then you dial it in more each event on what you have to, to strengthen in your game. Do you think overall though, you're well equipped to jump into a nine event uh, elite schedule? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it'd be a little foolish for me to say I'm completely prepared, um, you know, because I, I, I am a rookie and I, and I understand that, but I think, uh, I think there's a strength in that and recognizing that and trying my best to account for those, you know, areas that I'm, uh, it may be a weakness coming into this and, and try to account for that as best I can and, and try to plan accordingly um, to minimize those areas. So, um, yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, my success in the opens and, and doing well and, you know, having top tens in Tennessee and Florida and a lot of these places, I think in, in some regard, 
you know, proves that, uh, you know, I should do relatively well, but yeah, I feel, I feel confident about, um, how I prepare for events, how I practice for events and, and go into events. I, I definitely do a ton of prep work and, and research. Um, so yeah, I'd say overall, I feel good. I feel like I, you know, I think it'd be different if this was like the first year I did the opens and then I qualified, you know, I definitely wouldn't feel as confident, but, um, fishing against some of these guys in the opens and now to fish against them in the elites, I, I at least can come into it with some confidence. So I want to talk about this with you because this was, I saw your comment and you're an avid, you know, supporter of the opens. You fished it for six or seven years, like we talked about. Uh, but when we made the changes this year to where for, for 2023 people in the opens, you have to fish all nine events to make the elite series. You could still fish a specific division with hopes of the classic. You were never a nine event guy. Like you said, you were three events or six events. You were never, never able to do the nine events. So I, as an angler and as a worker, understand both aspects of it. People who wish we still had the three event schedule that you can still make the elite series, but then I get and see what we're trying to do in cultivating the best possible pros. We just announced our open schedule. We have nine events in eight different states. So we have them spread out. We have them kind of, they're still a little regionally based, but there's no more Northern Open, Southern Open, Central Open, just division one, two, and three. We have places like Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma and Eufaula in Alabama. We have Wheeler, Harris Chain, Toledo Bend, Ozarks, Bugs Island in Virginia. We have the St. Lawrence River and Watts Bar. So we have nine events in eight states throughout March to September and October time period. So it's really spread out. Do you think going forward, after we kind of get the changes worn off, that this will produce some anglers who – not only have the experience like you mentioned that you've done for multiple years of the opens, but also the ability being a traveled person across the whole United States to really be prepared when you step foot against the Seth fighters and the Brandon Polonix and the Brandon Lesters of the world every single day you launch your boat. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. I don't think anyone can deny the fact that whoever finishes in the top coming out of these events is, is going to have to be a very good angler and a well-rounded one because, you know, I looked at the schedule quickly before we jumped on. And like you just said, it's, it's all over the place. So there's no, you know, home field advantage. And, and so I think, uh, I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you and I have talked about it before and, and I, I do think it is a, a positive thing, right? You're, you're going to have a ton of strong sure. opinions on everything. I think as we talked about, you know, personally speaking, I think maybe the happy medium in my, you know, lowly opinion is just that, you know, maybe if you had the top guy from each division, you know, be able to qualify still, and you still allow that dream of making the elite series possible for, you know, guys who can't fish all nine, but um, listen, I certainly understand. And, and I heard your side of it too, with, with, uh, you know, just the supply and demand, you know, and the amount of people that are qualifying or, or want to qualify and, and are jumping in and the amount of fields that you can fill. So, I certainly understand it. And uh, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think uh, at the end of it, um, no one can deny that whoever does qualify next year is, is probably going to be more prepared by, from anyone just from the fact that you need to not only learn how to travel, how to practice, but you need to be able to manage all those things uh, traveling all around the country from March to October. Yeah, and I, I welcome all all opinions on here. This is the Bassmaster podcast, but it's not a if you don't like the nine events, get out type of thing, because I, I totally understand that, you know, and so there are changes that will be made as we kind of adjust and you, you structure things and you kind of feel it out. We've changed the format the last few years. We're trying to re-rack the system from 2019 where everything changed in the elite level and we have to keep that structure as consistent as possible and have everything aligned. So one thing that we did, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this probably, is we have in, implemented a 30-day off-limits period like we used to, like we have with the elite series. You know, 30 days from the event, you cannot fish that body of water until official practice. I think Hank Weldon has moved official practice from the standard, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the tournament week to maybe into that weekend. So you, your official practice days aren't three, maybe it's four or five days, but the no longer is going to be the eight, nine, 14 days of practice for people. So I can, I'm the stat guy. So basically I can say there are guys who have qualified from one division that will, that have been some of the best of all time. And then I can also say there are guys who've qualified from all nine that will be the best of all time. And there are some guys from both that will not factor in a few years. It's just the way it goes. There's no way that it's going to be a lineup perfectly where this is the route that's for sure. This is the route that's not because we know 
fish swim away. And so some of these anglers who are really good just don't perform. So in your opinion, does that 30 day off limits change uh, some of the dynamics for these guys? We're going to really see a well-rounded angler, not only because they have to fish the whole country, but they're also going to have limited practice time um, and an off limits period that, that kind of will resemble what they're going to face when they qualify for the elites. Yeah, I, I definitely think uh, you guys nailed it on that one. Um, and the couple of people that, you know, I was sharing text with before this uh, agreed, you know, I think everyone would agree that that should be a really good thing. Um, I didn't realize how many people did do that in the opens until this last, so this last tournament on the Chesapeake, of course, I had that much riding on it. So what I was doing was the, the couple of weekends leading up to the event, I'd, I'd work, you know, 40 hours and Monday through Thursday and then take off, you know, the weekend and, and go practice to try to learn that place. And I was like, man, there's a lot of people already down here. I, I, like, I can't believe it. So, cause I usually, like I said, I usually come down the weekend before and, and lead up to that. So I think, yeah, I think you guys nailed it with that. Um, I think five days is plenty of practice to be able to go to a new lake, learn that place and have a pretty good understanding and feeling of it and be able to con uh, compete against, you know, whoever it is that's jumping into these events. So I, I don't think anyone should have an issue with that. Um, I think it's also good with the off limits because it prepares you for the elite series, which, you know, I'm experiencing that now. Okay. If I'm going to pre-practice any of these places, how am I going to fit that into the schedule? How am I going to do that in a, a cost effective way? Um, so, yeah, I, I think from that standpoint, everyone should be happy with that. That's another area that kind of just now lines itself up with the elite series. And so to your point, just, you know, better prepares people to qualify that actually do. One thing that I heard from uh, David Williams, who's qualified for the Elite Series multiple times, he's won the Southern Opens points race, and not to diss any other divisions, if you win the Southern Opens points, that is always the most filled field. You know, it's full field every time, and it's always Florida, a tough place in the fall, and somewhere, you know, post-spawn. So you have to be able to catch them uh, multiple, you know, tournaments in a row. And David Williams told me one time, he said, I try not to do more than three days of practice because I'll end up developing too many patterns. And so people are like, if you're a new angler, I want to go spend as many days on a body of water as possible. But like you said, you learned how to practice. You took a day maybe, and you just drove around. And you didn't make any casts. You know, you might run around and just see the lay of the lake so that when you start fishing, you can remember where you saw things or you know what the body of water looks like. And David used to say, if I fish too many days on the water, I have too many patterns. And people will be like, having multiple patterns is never a bad thing. It is because as an angler, it confuses you on what you should do. This is a pattern I developed five days ago. Is it still happening now? And some of the times right. when we fish in the pre-spawn and the spawn, or even in the fall, what you found five days ago will not apply now. What you found two days ago may not apply now. So if you have multiple patterns, that pattern may be fading when you pick it up, or it may be coming in stronger and it's hard to interpret. So this will take a little confusion out of anglers because they're going to get out of their own way. What you find in those three or four days is what you find. And you have to live with it. Like you said, you got to find the regions, you got to fish smart and practice. And so that was interesting to hear somebody like David, who's qualified for the elites and has done well, you know, no matter what level he's been at, he's had spurts of success. So do you agree with that? That sometimes when you do fish four or five there, there's a place, maybe the Chesapeake, you need to be there five or six days. Cause it's so big. You got to, you got to run around and figure it out. And some of those other places you dial it in on day one or two and now you're like, I've got four more days. Now I just hope my pattern doesn't go away. Have you seen that happen for you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would just double down on that, you know, for twofold. One, I, I think like we've talked about, I think you can practice um, within five days and, and, you know, be able to cover most of a lake and, and learn it. Because again, it's, it's the difference of someone who's trying to learn where every single rock is in a creek, you know, in pre-practice versus actually just going through the creek, getting an idea of it. And then in the tournament itself, expanding on on that area so um i think yeah you know you can definitely practice five days um i would feel comfortable with and then secondarily to your exact point and i'll use this chesapeake for an example um when i was down there you know and, and the fishing is that tough and you're trying to say okay well you know i'm catching some fish here i'm catching a couple here well as you start to develop a pattern of kind of where you're getting fish and getting bites over the two three days well all of a sudden what are you gonna are you gonna go and and go completely 50 miles in the opposite direction and what if you find fish there you know it's not going to help you at all and so I found myself doing that I sort of you know in official practice for the open I said well I have we'll say a day and a half of practice left I could go check the elk or I could go check some of these other places that I haven't been yet 
but if I do that and I find fish, I'm spreading myself out so thin, you're actually counterproductive to what you're doing. I'm better off just expanding on the areas that I have found. So yeah, I think for, for multiple reasons, um, five days is a, I think it's a really nice cushion for guys who are in the opens to be able to learn a new lake, practice it, um, and feel comfortable going into an event while also preparing you for the less practice time that you have for an elite series. And I think it'll also make the fishing probably a lot better for these events because you don't have the pressure of 225 boats for five, six, seven, eight days, um, plus three days of tournament at times. So you're going to have maybe the fish will still be biting and they, they're not going to be super smart. So let's transition. Uh, we talked about it as soon as I called you and said, hey, man, congrats. I mean, I've, I've covered you in Florida. I've covered you in Tennessee. I've just I've known your name for a while. And, uh, and you actually introduced me to the brand Lunker City and that I saw them in a tackle store and got their nail weights for some Nico rigs one time and was like, that's the company that he's sponsored by. I now know I name recognition. And so I've known you for quite a while. Uh, you've had those posts of you, you know, in the junior series and the nation, series, you know, just young and like, it's cool to see those photos to, to now see you make the elite series. What kind of preparations have you had since then? Have you had a lot of people reach out, congratulate you? Have you had any sponsors that were on the fence with you in the opens, but now when you give them a call and you're an elite series qualifier, their tone is different. Have you experienced any positives from that over the last uh, two or three weeks since qualifying? Yeah, definitely. Um, the amount of support that I received just from qualifying and, and doing that was uh, definitely overwhelming. And, and it was awesome. It was awesome to see how many people, you know, followed me along and, you know, said that they were watching me, like you said, from years past. And so, so that was just a really cool thing to see. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I thought I was putting all this time and effort leading up to the open, the last open of the year. And I said, okay, you know, it's going to be nonstop, but when it's over, I'll at least have some time to take it easy. And, and it hasn't been that at all. It's, it's been nonstop. Um, you know, now I'm trying to look at the schedule, trying to plan things out. Like I said, am I going to pre-practice any of these places um, that I've never been to? Can I make that work financially? All that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, I've started to talk to some companies, but um, I think it's also important to talk about the fact that, you know, not a lot of people, but there's certainly some people and maybe even younger people who think that, uh, you know, when you make the elite series, everything's just crazy hunky dory, you know, no issues. Everybody gives you tons of money. Um, but no, and I, I kind of knew that. And I knew that coming into this. And thankfully, I've had some companies like Hummingbird, Shimano, Lunker City that I've already been working with and, and working towards this moment. So I'm, I'm talking with them and, and trying to make it work for this next year. Um, but it's also something I knew too, right? So the sponsor is not just can you catch fish? It's also, you know, can you do something for us? Can you promote our product in a way that is actually makes sense financially for both the company and for me? So yeah, it's, um, it's something I've been preparing for and something that, uh, you know, in this sense, I'm actually kind of looking forward to because that's what I went to school for. I went to school for marketing and business management, you know, actually so that I could prepare for, you know, fishing professionally and, and doing it on my own. Um, so yeah, you know, and at the end of the day, it's a good problem to have, you know, yeah. Because, Can uh, you provide uh, uh, value? That's always, that's always the question. And value 100%. isn't just on the, on the way in stage or on during a practice day, the value is shows and expos and, and I right. cast and, you know, stay for writers conference. Yes, exactly. Can you make a dent? in the economy positively for us so that we can make a positive impact for you. And it's hard to blend. It's hard not to blend in, in this industry because they're all yeah. trying to do the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I think more so now than ever before, because I think 20 years ago, that scene looked totally different. Um, whereas now with the power of social media, with the power of, you know, all these different avenues to get your name out and uh, promote, you know, there may be more co cost effective ways. And I see it even with, my, you know, Bunker city, because, there's different ways that you can advertise other than through, you know, an angler. And so you have to prove yourself worthwhile in terms of the value and content to these companies, because they're not just going to hand you money just because you ask for it. So it's, uh, it, it's, like I said, it's a great problem to have. I, I enjoy, you know, looking to next year and, and how I'm going to make everything work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely going to be a challenge next year. Was there a moment, I'm going to segue to your, to the back to the elite series in a second, but was there a moment this year in the opens where you said it's going to happen? Like this is, it's just, it's, this is the fish. 
when I needed it, or, you know, there's, there's 30 minutes left in the day and I feel my limit or I land a fish that I'm not supposed to catch. Was there ever a moment in the opens for the James Oneida and the Chesapeake where you're just like, this is meant to be, I can't, I can't mess this up and get in my way. This is, I, I, I feel so confident about this now. Ooh, I wish I could say there was, <laughs> I wish I could say, yeah, like I knew it was going to happen. It was day um, two weigh in the- right after you weighed your fish. And yeah, you said- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think there was, you know, small little moments along the way, right? Like at the James where I thought, you know, I was going to do okay. And, and so this is another great example, right? So at the James in practice, I caught a four pound fish and I just left that area, right? So I didn't catch more fish. I didn't expand on it. So really going into that event, I didn't know how I was going to do. So when I'm leading day one, you know, it was like, okay, like, you know, this is one of the events I was a little worried about. We had never been there that time of year. So yeah, in that sense, there was that moment. And then there was also, I'd say the moment at the last event where, you know, I knew on day two, if I got a limit, you know, doing the math, being the, the miniature version of the statistician that you are, um, I said, I, I, I think I should be able to have enough to qualify. And so when I caught that fifth fish, um, I felt, yeah, I felt pretty good. And I said, okay, you know, things have finally come together. You know, it's, there wasn't too many curveballs this year. Everything worked good. Nothing broke down. All my equipment worked perfectly. So um, I, I wouldn't say there was any one particular moment, but just a bunch of little ones. That's awesome. So now back to the elite series, you said there are some lakes that you might have to pre-practice for. There's lakes you haven't been to looking at the elite series schedule where we go to Okeechobee Seminole. We have the classic. Then we go to Murray Santee Cooper. Then we have Lay Lake, uh, the Sabine river, St. Clair. Then we have Champlain and the St. Lawrence to end the year out. Those are the nine events. What events have, or what lakes have you not been to? And maybe if you've been to them, you just haven't been there that time of the year. So it's a different body of water to you. Yeah, so I think uh, the only ones I've been to are Champlain and St. Lawrence. Um, I don't think I've been to any of the other ones. I haven't been to any of the ones in Florida. or um, oh, I've been to Lay Lake for that open, but that was in, I think, December or January. December, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, that is, that is for sure. So uh, the only thing that I think that does benefit me is a couple of these events should be bed fishing events. Um, or right around that time and so you know a I think that takes away some of the local knowledge of you know having those different areas in the summer um, and just being able to go bed fishing and so if that's the case I, I feel very confident about that because those most of those Florida events that I did well in was bed fishing. Yeah and you even did well in some of those Florida events where most people were bed fishing by using other techniques you know whether you weren't just right up on the bank, you're just outside an edge or you were, you know, that kind right. of thing. So that'll be interesting as well. But yeah. Uh, do you have anybody that you, you know, have talked to that you might room with next year? You know, I know that there's a roommate. Uh, some guys like to be solo. Some guys like to camp. Some guys like to have a buddy that they rent a house with or a hotel and have that kind of person they trust and practice that they can just bounce ideas off of. Have Do you have that already already developed or are you kind of going to, just see where you fit in the first few events until you make friends. Yeah. Uh, it might be option number two. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to see, I'm going to see who's available. I know a few people, but um, some of those people already have travel buddies. So I got to see if I can fit in or not, you know, if I can uh, cut down on the expenses, I would absolutely love to do that. But uh, I don't know. It might be a solo trip for the first couple of events and first season, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Have you had anybody uh, reach out and give you some advice? They're an elite series pro that they followed your career. They know who you are. Maybe they knew you before you even fished the opens and have said, Hey, I just want to let you know, don't listen to this guy or don't listen to that guy or don't listen to doc talk. What is it? Is it, is it don't take pre-practice, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Has, has anyone reached out and said anything to you positively for that? Yeah, it's funny, actually, it was uh, yesterday, someone said all of those things to me. Um, (laughs) uh, So I actually, we won't ask you to disclose the guys that they said to trust and not trust. We won't, we won't. Right, right. Um, No, so it's funny. So yesterday, I actually talked to uh, um, Brandon um, Palinick yesterday on the phone, and he was driving up to the mountain. So I got him for like 20 minutes, and then we lost service. But um, yeah, it was cool. I got to ask him some questions and just to try to get a better understanding about practice, off limits, you know, the the no info rule and um, just a lot of different things like that. And, you know, what to, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, like, you know, cause he, one of the cool little stats is that the year that he won the national championship, 
uh, down in Louisiana on that stage was the same stage that I was actually weighing in on for the Junior Bassmaster World Championship. So we were down there together. So that was cool. But um, yeah, one of the things he said is exactly what he said, you know, don't listen to the doc talk, don't listen to, you know, these preconceived notions. And um, I think that is something that at least on an open level, um, I'm pretty good at, you know, obviously the elite series is a totally different level. So there's a lot more pressure. There's a lot more on the line, but um, it was cool. Even just for 20 minutes to be able to talk to him and, you know, as good of an angler as he is and where he's come from and also coming up through the Bass Nation, you know, it was, it was cool to have a, a conversation with him. That's awesome. Alex, uh, appreciate you taking the time and joining us for the Bassmaster podcast today. We're so excited for the grouping of rookies, no matter who they are every year, because we know it's either a dream realized, a dream come true, or it's something that they've just worked so hard at that the, their relief, the pressure's off their shoulders and a different kind of pressure is going to be on when it comes to January, February of next year when the season starts. So we appreciate you joining us. Congratulations on accomplishing that. Where can people find you and follow your journey, uh, whether it's through social media or, uh, you know, uh, in other ways? Yeah, I'd say the biggest thing to follow me is just on Instagram and Facebook. I'm I'm the biggest on Instagram. Um, and you, as you said, Ronnie, you know, and I've had it for so long now, I can't get rid of it. But uh, it's Alex Weatherell, and I, I always add the Bassmaster, but with two A's at the end, um, in the middle. So yeah, Alex Bassmaster Weatherell on uh, most social medias. That's awesome. Well, Alex, we appreciate you. Congratulations on that. Now the work begins. Like I said, when I called you, congratulations, take a breath, go get some dinner and now get prepared for the elite series. And I know that you'll be well prepared and you'll be taking it in every step of the way. So congratulations, man. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you for your time. Of course.